I like handle work. Um, I, I do all the handle work. We've done over 25,000 knives and I've shaped every handle by hand. So I do put a lot of time and passion into the handles. The handles, they should be comfortable. The knife should be comfortable. It should be a sexy looking knife. Life's too short to carry an ugly knife. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 52 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to episode 52, as we said, of the Knife Junkie podcast. It's our uh, weekly interview show, a good interview uh, lined up with us uh, today. Bob, Andy Roy, Fiddleback Forge, and uh, man, I tell you, as I was researching and listening to the interview, just amazing everything he's he's involved with, not only making the knives, but the uh, Georgia Knife Making Guild, uh, also an, uh, a relatively new owner of Pops uh, Knife Supply. Man, he's all over the place. Yeah, well... uh Andy came on my radar uh, with his Fiddleback Forge, mostly on Instagram, as a lot of knife makers come onto my radar, but also also on YouTube. He produces, he and the and the individuals in his shop, it's about a five person shop, put out some serious knife eye candy. That's what really <laughs> that's what really drew <laughs> me in. All right. Uh, these these beautifully refined yet unrefined blades, meaning uh, they're beautifully ground, but but some of the scale is left on on the flats, which uh, gives it kind of a rustic look. And then these superb handles. Now, I've never held a fiddleback forge knife, but they just look comfortable. They're even comfortable to look at on the eyes. So much attention is spent on the ergonomics and the aesthetics of the handles. Uh, just take a look and, and you'll see all these beautiful materials, beautiful pin configurations. He goes, he goes, off the charts with the pins on his uh, knife handles. And mm -hmm. that might sound goofy, you know, for me to mention as a standout, but it is. You take a look at his knives and they're striking. Each knife comes through his hands. He grinds each knife and profiles each handle. And he has, for each one of the 25,000, I think was the number, 25,000 knives that mm -hmm. come out of his mm -hmm. shop. Just just a few. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> you'll, you'll hear in the interview, but he also is one of these guys... The perfect example of preparation meeting opportunity. He had been a hobbyist knife maker, and then the opportunity was forced on him to become a full time knife maker, and he was ready to go. He, yeah. he had he had a you know everything he needed for for the start of a shop, which obviously he built once the company was flourishing. It's it's another one of those American dream stories, at least uh, from the outside, that right. uh, is inspiring to me. Well, not only do you have to be ready, you have to take the step. You have to take the opportunity, and, and man, has he ever. And his website is gorgeous, and as you said, the uh, the pictures of the knives uh, show the scales, if you will, or the, you know, the rustic look and just uh, just beautiful, and that's at uh, fiddlebackforge.com. You can find all that stuff. We'll have links to Andy's uh, webpage, Instagram, uh, Pops Knife Supply, all that kind of good stuff on the show notes, which you can find at thenifejunkie.com slash 52. And before we head into that interview with Andy, I want to remind you that Knives 2020, the new 40th edition uh, of the uh, not popular Knives book, is now out. Over 800-something full-color pictures, just a gorgeous book. If you want to find out more, you can uh, go to thenifejunkie.com slash knives2020, thenifejunkie.com slash knives2020. Now, we'll tell you that is an affiliate link to Amazon where you can purchase the book in paperback or in Kindle. It's not going to cost you any more if you uh, use our link, but it does uh, help uh, the Knife Junkie podcast uh, help us keep the lights on here. So. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Knives2020. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. So I'm here speaking with Andy Roy, knife maker, whose Fiddleback Forge sets the bar for handmade outdoor and camp knives. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. The first thing that really comes to mind when I look at your knives is how they're all the same but different. Uh, to me, you know, I went through art school and I was obsessed with drawing portraits and they all looked like me, but all a little bit different. Tell me what sets your knives apart from the other outdoor and camp knives. I don't know that, well, I guess I, guess I do have a style that I make knives, um, of my knives. 
Uh, but I don't know that I, you know, functionally they're really set apart. Uh, there, there's some things that I'm passionate about and that I believe, like I can't stand choils, so you won't see those on my knives. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm an eight inch hunting and fishing knife. Everybody's is pretty good. Well, when you look at your knives, you really notice the handles. I mean, the aesthetics, there's a lot of attention put into the aesthetics of them. I have a Condor Bush Lore knife, and it's a great outdoor knife, but there are no embellishments. There is no, um, seemingly no uh, labor or love put into them. You look at your handles, and they are intricate, and they look comfortable. I like I like handle work. Um, I, I do all the handle work. We've done over 25,000 knives, and I've shaped every handle by hand. So I do put a lot of time and passion into the handles. When I was a kid, I carved walking sticks. And so the, and I know was a furniture maker. So the metal work is what I had to learn. I already knew the, the woodworking and the, the adhesives and those things, but the metal work I had to catch up on. But the handles, they should be comfortable. The knife should be kind of, should be sexy looking knife. Life's too short to carry an ugly knife. I couldn't agree more or, or an inadequate knife. Right. Or right. too few knives. Uh, many knives is better. <laughs> I mean, your your knives actually, just by definition, seem imminently collectible. You might decide that uh, you like a certain pattern for the function and for the way it feels, but you can kind of almost endlessly get in one of those collector's loops and keep getting the same one because the handles are all so unique. <laughs> well, they are unique. It's funny. Uh, there, there have been some collectors that have collected just one model to the point that... Uh, I, I'm just honored to have that happen, but you just kind of stand back and it's pretty amazing. You know, we make over a hundred models of knives now and, uh, it's, I'm just lucky that they appeal to somebody. Do you discontinue knives or uh, do you have all of those designs kind of active at once? I discontinue knives if after a while as I'm making the knife, I don't think it's a very good design. And then recently I discontinued about 30 or 40 models just because I, I was just kind of salty. You know, I was just kind of salted on that model. But some of them are still very good models that I'll go back to someday. But some of them I'm just going to move away from. You just kind of got sick of making them? Yeah, we've made a lot of them. We've made a lot of them. It's time to something fresh. You make, uh, you said your hands touch every knife. You've shaped every handle. And yet you've made 25,000 knives. How long have you you've been around for about... 11 years? 10 something? years, 10 years full time on May 1st. That's when I got laid off. Wow. Uh, so that was 10 years full time and I made knives for a couple of few years before that. What, what were you doing that you were laid off from? I was an electrical engineer by trade and I was working as a project manager at a company at that time. So how, how have you managed to make 25,000 knives? I know I've seen uh, a number of your Fiddleback Friday videos. I know you're not working alone. No. I do the, I do the blade grinding and the handle shaping. And, um, so that's the parts that I do. And then the, you know, so the drilling, the profiling, the sanding, those kind of things are generally done by an employee. At one time we had 11 employees. We were doing 67 knives a week. Wow. And now we're doing 20 knives a week and I'm much happier with much fewer employees. Hey, yeah. Were you feeling the crush, uh, to just keep making knives like, I was, dri I, I was driven. I was driven to just, just make more, more, more. I'm still driven to make knives. I'm totally addicted to it. I don't think I'll ever stop. Well, you know, as your my hands are getting old and my eyes are getting old now. I'm 46. Yeah. Oh, so. gee. <laughs> it's, it's, it's starting to hurt a little to make knives, so maybe one day I'll quit. But. I got you beat, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right, too. Hopefully the podcast doesn't give you arthritis. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Too much typing. <laughs> I noticed that you have a number of people in your shop. You seem to cultivate new talent. What's your philosophy on that? That seems... Uh... You know, it was weird. I had just gone full-time, and Dylan Fletcher showed up and wanted to be an apprentice. And I felt like, dude, you're apprenticing under a guy that's just learning this, this crap. Mm -hmm. uh, but it worked out, and he learned to make knives very fast, and I saw that. And I really enjoyed teaching it. So eventually I just... You know, kept offering that situation. And, and, you know, for the business, if I suck somebody into my business as an employee and they're learning to profile knives and drill knives and sand handles, it's hard to hold somebody in that job. But if at the same time you've made them an apprentice, you can keep them in that job a little longer. And it's, it's really worked out. There's 
I'm kind of impressed when I look back at the different makers that have been through my shop and been through my apprentice program. It's humbling. It's uh, like you, you're not just giving them a job. Uh, you're giving them hope at the end of it that they can. Right. You know, I mean, self actualize. How, right? how, how, how else do you break into being an artisan? You either do it all on your own or you can, or for me, you can come and learn. I'll teach you the whole business. I'll help you with your, with your logo. I help you get your website set up. Um, I help you tell you when your knives are sellable and what the market will bear on them. You know, that's huge for a craftsman. Uh, just that part, deciding what to sell the knives for is a huge thing to be able to come and ask and, you know, 250, you know, so. Yeah. Pricing of a product. You, you don't want it too low. You right. don't want it too high. Right. You know, you don't want it prohibitive, but, you know, at the same time, you're making a luxury item, if you don't mind my saying. Like you said, you could, you could buy a, a knife at the fraction of the cost and it will do the same job, yeah. but it won't, it won't have the same soul and it won't mean the same thing to you. Right. And the work you do with it won't mean the same. Most of my knives are carbon steel for that same reason, so that there's a mark on them. You know, they, they're tarnished. They, those are memories on the steel, the sole of the knife. So even when you were doing something else before you had this uh, awesome job, uh, as it seems from the outside anyway, making knives and, and, and having a successful knife company, you were still a hobbyist uh, or were you a hobbyist? I was. I, I did. I did knives as a hobby for two and a half years as I was, you know, in my garage with a forge I built out of kitty litter and a, and a big water trough and a hair blow dryer. Before that, I did furniture and humidors. I made those. I could finish a knife quicker. So I liked that hobby because I could come home for the weekend and get four hours time away from the family and finish a knife. And that's, wow. you know, those are the knives I make, the four hour knives. Four so hour knives. That's what I teach my guys. We're making a four hour knife. You can't do it by yourself in four hours. Then you're going beyond what I'm trying to teach you. Soup to nuts, even with the, even with the gorgeous handle. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Well, I can see how that, that that could be enticing, especially if you have you always been knife uh, oriented. Are you hunt huntsman or? I hunt. I shoot. Uh, my granddaddy collected knives, and you know he was always you know catalogs, and we would look at the catalogs together and circle one. And if you could have one on this page, which yeah, be? yeah, that's yeah, we did a lot of that, and um, you know the A.G. Russell catalog. Oh yeah, you know we flipped through that all the time. So, and then you know I was in it. So that was a nice thing to be able to show them. Oh, yeah. Man, it's amazing how many uh, grandfathers are culprits. Not culprits, but <laughs> are, are, are the inspiration of, uh, of the knife hobby or the knife life. Or I, I would imagine not just knives. I mean, I, my grandfather taught me lots of cool stuff. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's does. Mine was into fishing and outdoors, but I'm sure I, my other granddaddy was into pool, and he was a pool shark. And, uh -huh, man, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, he taught me a little bit of that. You, you got I'm not both very angles. good at it. <laughs> you, you got both angles. You got the the slick urban and the and the cool outdoorsman. Right. Nice. And, and none of mine were into cars. I'm sure there's tons of guys whose granddaddy taught them all about cars. Well, I think that generation, you and I are similar age, and so our grandfathers are probably similar age. Uh, mine are passed away, but they were to. children of the Depression, you know, and yeah. and uh, and so self reliance was big. And I think that's part of what always kind of drew me to knives was this concept of the man walking around with a belt knife, you know, capable of doing whatever, you know, fighting a right. bar or like starting a campfire. Right. So all of your stuff is, is really outdoorsy. Um, it, is that who you find your, your biggest clients are people who are out there on campsites? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, my knives are woods bumming knives for the most part. I do make some, some weapony knives and some evil looking knives. The femme fatale and the needle. The femme fatale, the, the Bourbon Street skinner. I mean, you're not, you don't skin deer on Bourbon Street. So. <laughs> um, but I think for the most part, they're, they're sort of outdoor camp knives, which is what I loved to do with my knives when I was a boy, just bumming around the woods with my K bar. They really seem to be, um, appreciated. In other words, you're, you're using that knife to, to skin an animal. You're also going to appreciate the experience of hefting it and using it. I think that's the point of making them comfortable and beautiful so that you're, you know, sometimes you just take a break from the work and look at the knife and smile. <laughs> yeah. So you use some crazy micartas, I've noticed. Micarta is just about my favorite uh, handle material. I love it. Mine too. I've been replacing a lot of my pocket knife scales with micarta if I can find them. 
it's indestructible. Um, you know, and it's, I find it to be lovely. I, I've always liked mixing it in. Even, you know, even when the, with a wood handle, if the, if the yes. bolsters are Micarta, I love oh, that. Yeah. I just like that. I love the Micarta pins. Although a lot of that is about making the knife easier to make. But I love those Micarta pins. I think they look great. Yeah, you mean the the odd, not oddly uh, placed, but there are many pins on your knives. I, do they yeah, I like all- throwing pins all over them. I, I I love the way that looks. I had I had a guy when I was first making knives tell me that oh you're getting stupid with the pins and it doesn't look professional, and I just went crazy and I put pins everywhere on the knife after that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I fight those kind of restrictions. <laughs> well, yeah, that's absurd. But a, a lot of that was just about making the knife easier to make. Um, the Micarta pins, they never sand proud of the handle material. You never, you never feel that bump. And they never burn, you know, the handle material, you know, the burning ones, especially like maple and Osage. You know, you put a metal pin in there, you, you overheat it, or God, God forbid, a copper pin. Uh, and then you overheat it, and it makes a little black halo around the pin. And, uh, Micarta pins never do that. So. A lot of that was just to make the knife easier to make. Interesting. Mm. It, it ends up being kind of a signature look for you. <laughs> it kind of worked out that way. It's kind of goofy. Wait, wait. So, so when you overheat um, a pin, say, and it's mm-hmm. in a burnable wood, like you mentioned, Osage, for instance, does that also um, weaken the integrity of the glue holding it in, the epoxy? I would imagine it affects the glue, yes. I would imagine it does. The glue is not meant to get that hot. There's specs on glue bottles, you know. They work from this range to this range, and then they break down. So I would imagine so. So how long did it take you? So you just kind of just started making knives. You you were in the garage for two years as a hobbyist, and then you got laid off, and you said, "This is my this is my chance." Mm-hmm. And you started. What was your learning curve like? When were you producing knives that were um, worthy of the fiddleback name or your name? Well, I had been making and selling knives under the Fiddleback name for a couple of years as a hobbyist. I had a full shop. Everything was up. Okay. The website was there. The, the forum pages were there. The Instagram was there. So I just got laid off, and my wife has the better job. She's got the better <laughs> career. So we weren't going to move for my yeah. career. And I called her, and I said, look, I got laid off, and I'm going to be a full-time knife maker. And she didn't have a lot of supportive things to, to say about that plan. <laughs> But over time, she's become more supportive. <laughs> well, yeah. And she didn't say get out, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure that does happen. <laughs> Many knife makers live on the You say you're going to do what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this learning curve uh, with, with materials and forming your, your, your overall look, was that kind of locked in once you started? I mean, obviously, it was preparation meeting opportunity, and you were ready to go. Mm-hmm. But once everything was on the line, how did that change your knife making? God, I don't know. I just think I got a lot more practice right away. You know, I went from making 10 or 12 knives a month to 10 or 12 knives a week. And also pretty quickly, I figured out that, uh, you know, those knives at 10 or 12 knives a month, I had all this demand or I thought I had all this demand. And then I went full time and I quadrupled that amount of knives. And my demand wasn't what I thought it was when I made the supply four times as much. So it was, there was a lot of you know, just scrapping. Just, oh, what can I sell this week? How can I make them pretty? How can I make them better? You know, how can I make them more consistent and faster? That's how the spalted steel came about. That pattern is on the flats of my knives. That again is about making the knife easier to make. If you texture the flats of the knives, it's way easier to finish the flats of the knives. You only have to finish the high spots. So that once again was about making it more efficient to make the knives, doing all, you know, all of it myself. So forge is in your name. How does, uh, how does that play out? It was an internet handle <laughs> that I had when I started making knives and I was, I was forging knives at that time. I might have forged, you know, 10 knives in my whole career. <laughs> and then I figured out, well, it's a lot more efficient to do these bar stock. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I know exactly what that steel is. <laughs> right. I mean, it makes it makes sense for for your kind of output. So now, uh, eleven years into the game, you're 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 humming along. Is is how it looks from the outside, anyway. <laughs> and uh, it seems like you have a really good thing going. You have a tight crew. You have this Friday night fiddleback release video, which is yeah. really cool. 
I, I want to talk about that, but I'm going to tell you what my picks are from the last one. I okay. love the Warthog, which okay. I know is a big one. Yeah. Uh, the CR1, and then the Needle and the Gunstock. Yeah. Those, those, those four. It's all ones. new designs. You know, since I got uh, salty on those old ones, I threw them out. I drew 30 new knives. Um, and those, all, all that you picked are brand new designs. So, so you're not a custom knife maker. You are a, a maker no. of handmade knives. No. And, and you have a very interesting way of selling, I think. The Fiddleback Friday, I just, I thought of, I thought of the marketplace sort of as, um, that you needed to feed it regularly, like a pet or something. Um, and the Fiddleback Friday, we just kind of stumbled into that. I think, I think actually the guys on the forum voted to have the sale on Friday. And then the name popped out. I don't think I made up the name. I think it was some guy on the forum made up the name. And we've just kind of run with that. It's really neat because there's not a lot of jobs where you work all week. And then at the end of the week, you get to see the exact results, both, both, you know, physically and economically of your work. And generally people are giving you, you know, comments and criticisms, mostly compliments, you know, so mm-hmm. a lot, not a lot of people say, Hey, you did so good this week. These are beautiful. This is so, <laughs> uh, it's, that's one really rewarding part of what I got set up. Yeah, that's true. Actually, most jobs, you don't see either what you're doing or producing or what the effect is. And most of the time, you don't see both of those things. And that can be, you know, demoralizing. But having a direct relationship with materials and then the goods that you're churning out. Right. And the community around it, too. I mean, I've been doing it 12 years. These guys, you know, Customers, they travel down here for Blade Show and we do a bunch of events down here. They travel down for tons and tons of events and, and so there's a community around it. It's, it's really humbling and amazing. So how have you seen the knife community react to you over the years as you've, as you came in and made a name? Kind of crazy. The, the knife community is the most open arms community of people that's just been accepting from the start. Kind of nuts. Even when I came in, you know, when I came in and I'm making full time, I think my knives looked terrible in 2009 when I went full time. But they were selling and, you know, I was in the Georgia Knife Makers Guild. And those guys never once acted like they were irritated or pissy or any of that. They just welcomed me with open arms and I learned, I've, I've learned a ton being involved with the Georgia Knife Makers Guild. Have you mentored with anyone? Uh, you're mentoring other uh, young young talent mm-hmm. or new talent, I should say. I don't know how young they are. All over the spectrum. So, are you being? Uh, do you do you have certain people you look to for mentorship? Oh yeah, Tom Crine was uh, Dan Coster and Scott Gossman. We, these are guys that took my questions again and again and again. And then you get into the Georgia Guild and you're looking at Carl Rex Steiner and John Shore, Scott Davidson, and Dennis Bradley. Th- these guys just have taken questions again and again and influenced and helped me and watched me not take their advice and <laughs> they still put up with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a bunch of, you, you can't be involved in this community, you know, and now I'm in the, you know, the, the Knife Makers Guild as well and voting member in that organization. You know, you're surrounded by Todd Begg and, you know, all those great makers from Texas. Uh, so, yeah, wow. an amazing community to be a part of. What are your feelings on the, um, Chinese market, the high-end manufacturers. I know a lot of makers and designers uh, go to them for OEM work uh, to produce uh, more um, affordable versions of their knives, but at a, at a high level. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you think of that new force in the market over the last five or six years? I just, you know, if you can, if you can bring a product product to market that you can sell, I got nothing, no problem with you. Uh, I'm not having that done with my knives. But if somebody made an offer and the thing worked out, I don't know that I wouldn't. Like I said, a business is hard. The knife business is a hard business. And if you bring a product to market, you're out there enthusiastic about selling it and you can culture enthusi- enthusiasm in a group of people, then more power to you. Yeah. I got no problem with that. You have a mid tech line. What is that? It is, it was the idea was to try and make a line of knives that I didn't have to put in any of the physical work on. I could do sort of an intellectual property line of knives and my crew that I already had there and trained up could actually manufacture that line of knives. It didn't really work out. I think there's a lot of good knives there and everything, but uh, never was super profitable. 
So I've tried a couple of things like that, a mid-tech where most of the stuff was done on machines. And then I did uh, Coming Blade Works USA where it was all handmade, but it was my designs and they were making them in the shop. But really the fiddleback knives are what sells. And yeah. Yeah. So the just is what it is. Well, those mid-tech knives are actually uh, good looking. And man, I'm they're always, cool knives. They, they really are. are. Especially the uh, the smaller the two machetes, man, that is beautiful. Now we still do the we still do the machete significantly. I think the machetes are are just too good not to do. I think it's a really interesting idea that that you were doing a mid tech within your own shop. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's uh, that deserves a different kind of name because I always think of uh, the term mid tech as everything outsourced and right. then coming to your location and you like putting it together and. And uh, fine tuning it, but in but you're doing the whole thing. It's yeah. just not your hands; it's right. your assistant's hands. Yeah. So we tried it one way, then we tried it another way. Neither of them worked. I'm gonna keep trying. Oh, you know, they yeah. say they say successful people just keep trying until they succeed. So you know. Yeah. Just roll with the punches. Good idea. Good looking knives. Really cool idea of how to produce it. Maybe yeah. it just wasn't that that time at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Never can tell. There's so many good knives out there right now that it's uh, it's a tough business. Knives are challenging. So uh, do you carry anybody else's knives? I got a vast collection of knives. The one I'm carrying right now is, is by Russell Reese, one of my apprentices. Uh, he gave it to me the other day, and I've been carrying it and cutting boxes at Pops. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I carry other guys' knives all the time. You were influenced by someone, and now I can't remember his name, but but you were showing off the handle and how it's got a uh it's got a a little swale in the back mm. so it it makes like the perfect little three to four handed grip yeah um I think you picked up one of his knives at at blade show or something like that yeah, it was Carl Recksteiner's knife Carl Recksteiner mm-hmm. oh the c r one right the c r one right okay yeah i i I'm loving that uh you you've been doing some interesting things with handles lately like with the gun stock with the CR1, and then there was another one that was even sh- smaller. It was almost the size of the Runt, I believe. We had, so there's another new one out that's called the Snowbill, and that was that was influenced by Bill Snow, another Georgia guild maker. Uh, and he's been making that knife for 50 years, so it looks like it would be the wonkiest thing and the most uncomfortable, uncomfortable thing in your hand, but really it just fits on your hand like an old glove, and it's, it's an amazing little hand. I, I showed it to a guy at this show we were at this weekend with Pops Knife Supply, and... Uh, the guy looked down at it and he goes, I've been wanting to see this in person and he holds it. Okay. Wow. So I, I, I find it challenging to take the ugliest shape and see if I can make it comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I've drawn a couple in this recent batch that are just ugly and dumb. There's one that looks like a shark eating a little minnow or something, in it. <laughs> but it, it comes out. So com- I'm only going to make four or five of them, but uh, it comes out so comfortable in my hand that, and the point is in just the right spot. So I kind of want to. <laughs> I kind of like the goofy thing. <laughs> well, actually, that I was going to say that handle intuitively looks comfortable to me. Like yeah. it looks like like that little hump towards the back would would nestle nicely between my. Uh, I know you talk about putting the finger right on top of it, mm-hmm. but my my hands it looks like it might fit. Uh, uh, you know, with the pinky on the outside, giving it a little bit of control and closure. It just looks like a comfortable handle. I always try and make it where the the handle you can hold the handle more than one way. And there's a lot of different ways you hold a knife. You know, you got the stake cut and the up cut and chest lever thing. All the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. crafters talk about it. I, I can't ever find a use for that, but uh, whatever. Reverse chest pull. <laughs> yeah. <whatever. laughs> uh, so. so you have this barracuda that also has uh, an interesting handle. Uh, mm-hmm. It almost looks like a fishtail. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah. But it it also, I mean, to me, there has to be some utility in that, and it looks like the. Uh, it looks like it's it's built for a whole bunch of different handholds. It is, and it's a very it's a wide open handle. I, I learned from the guys on my forum that uh, you can have a five inch handle, but you've only got three and a half usable inches because there's so many you know accents outside the shape of the handle. But this mm-hmm. is a wide open handle, so it's a full five inch handle, and it's wide open. So if your hands are even wider than that, and I, believe it or not, I get guys with massive hands. <laughs> Uh, I've had to design some goofy looking knives to go with these massive hands. But it, this one's wide open, so, you know, it never closes off. Your fingers can fall off the end without it being uncomfortable, you know, if they're eight inches wide or whatever they are. So, so what is your, what's your overall design philosophy? How do you, how do you approach knowing that you need to work on another model? How do you approach 
what that model's for and what it looks like? I'll generally pick a function and a, and a size factor. And then I'll, I'll design. I always start with the spine of the knife and I'll draw something. And then I'll base the knife around it. And I'll do six or so on a page. And then once I get something that I kind of like, I always redraw it on a separate page and try to get three or four more models out of it at different sizes. So, so it'll go all the way down to the runt size and then all the way up to the duke size. And out of that, you'll get some that really work and some that really don't. And then I'll try a different shape for the spine and start over. So with your um, mode of releasing knives uh, or, or selling them, is, is that a direct – do you get direct feedback? In other words, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make a small batch of this new knife and, and see if it works in the hands of the people who use them. Do you, do you operate like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I watch that forum a lot. You know, they, those guys are smart. They, they really have stuck their enthusiasm. It's, it's, it's the enthusiasm that just amazes me. And like that usable handle length concept. I didn't learn that from a knife maker. I learned that on the forum. I mean, they had sketches and here's the handle length and then here's the usable handle length. They were right. You know, so you gotta, you gotta look at the feedback. Knife makers get a lot of feedback. <laughs> you get a lot of feedback. <laughs> I, I wonder if wrench makers get as much feedback or, uh, or, or clamp that. makers. <laughs> <laughs> I can make a sexy wrench. <laughs> it's, well, that, that's the whole thing. Like, it, it's that, you know, knives have a sort of uh, intangible appeal. Um, well, that goes beyond a uh, tool and it goes mm. beyond weapon. By the way, I like that you dabble in, in weaponry because I love weaponry. Very dabbling, very dab. I, yeah. I like the stupid, stupidest weapon. I, I like cavalry sabers. Oh. <laughs> I'm into French uh, and English cavalry sabers. Like those big, uh, uh, the, the kind they used at Waterloo with the big, yeah, that yeah. big saber with the fat. Ugh. Mm -hmm. The uh, this British 1796 is what I really want to be able to make. Uh, okay. It's so challenging. It's ridiculous. The blade is. So we'll see. I, I made I made my first sword and broke the tip off of it before I got the handle on it. So, <laughs> wait, you made your first sword? So, do you make swords on I'm, any sort of regular? Basis? I was working on it. We we recently, me and three partners, uh, bought Pops Knife Supply, so it kind of cut into my dabbling in the in the swords. But uh, at, the, at the time, I was trying to put a saber together, and I ground it out and fit the basket handle to it, and carved the grip and. Sent it out and got it heat treated and got it back and broke the tip off before I put it together. <laughs> so, wow. Right in front of everybody in the shop. That, that was, must have been horrible. Yeah, it was, that was not my best moment. <laughs> before we get, I want to hear about Pop's Knife Supply, but before we do, I just want to follow up on the needle. Tell me about mm. the needle. Sometimes you just draw a knife and then you try to, try to make it super, super, I like to do this. I like to try to make it ridiculously skinny. And that's what it, the needle came from that gun stock. And the back of it, if you look, still has that gun stock curve. I just like that yeah. little curve on the back. I said, well, let me just put that back there and then take everything out of the width of the knife and make it absolutely as pointy as you can get it. And that's where that came from. That little swale in the back of the handle that you like actually seems like it would aid in thrusting, like, uh, like it would nestle into the root of your palm here. It might. That was one of my ideas of it. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe it would. I mean, it is so sharp at the tip. It's ridiculous. I, uh, I get them, I lay them in these trays. And then I'll turn around and use my fingernail to lift one out of the tray to pick it up to do some <laughs> operation. Well, this thing was already sharp, and it went directly through my fingernail. I mean, oh, I've done man. a lot of knives. <laughs> and it just sunk through my fingernail like it wasn't there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Does that thing have a cutting edge? Oh, yeah. Okay. What's the point of making a knife? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, well, the point. It, it does look like an assassin's stiletto from like a... Yeah. Oh, it has a cutting edge. <laughs> So, Pops Knife Supply, you, you, you casually dropped that you just bought that. What is that? Oh, uh, well, Pops Knife Supply has been in business for 40 years. James Pops Poplin started it almost 40 years ago, and uh, he just wanted to retire, and he was right around the corner from us. So, me and I got some partners together, and we bought it, threw it in the shop. So, is it uh, you sell uh, supplies to knife makers, or mm -hmm. is it a, just a knife shop? No, it's, a, it's supplies to knife makers. Right. I'm sure all the knife makers are cringing right now. I'm sure it's a, it's something everybody knows about. So sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's busy. Oh my God. It's busy. <laughs> oh man. Well, that's good news. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like the knife world is burgeoning. I, I think, um, 
AutoCAD is a um, great, what do you want to call it, leveler of, of playing field. I feel like people mm-hmm. who, who've never lifted a hammer, or, or I guess that's a symbolic hammer, it, mm-hmm. someone who's never approached a grinder can, if they can use AutoCAD, can have a knife made. And I think that's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, me too. I, it's, it's definitely a, um, I call it a renaissance of craftsmanship. I think we're having. It's not just knives, but we're definitely. I mean, the knife steels that we have now, they're amazing. You know, the the handle shapes, the variety, the hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of makers at Blade Show. It's so crowded, and it, I don't know if anybody there is a knife buyer anymore. They're all knife makers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a renaissance of craftsmanship going on. I think it's. Uh, I think it's because our wives work. I don't think. I actually think most of the renaissance of craftsmanship is because the guys were able to do this stuff in their garage because their wife works and they get the insurance. For me, that was what it was. And um, I, I, all the knife makers I know have wives that can get insurance or they'd be in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Myself and most of my friends are all in that similar boat. Yeah. Interesting. That's the first time I've heard that because I, I've talked a lot with a lot of different people about how the knife world has expanded just under my, um, this is going to sound corny, but under my watch, that means for as long as I've been paying attention right. to it on YouTube, uh, I've always been a knife collector since I was little, mm-hmm. but I guess my first nut and fancy video in 2008 and, uh, it's exploded since then. Crazy. Yeah. When I got into it, you, you had, you know, three or four choices to get a grinder. You know, you, you got a, a baiter or, you know, there was three or four choices. It's Wilton Square Wheel. And, and now you could research grinders and have a spreadsheet of a hundred different choices. And that's not all of them. So where, where do you think it's all going? Do you think, uh, do you think it becomes a crowded field? It's a crowded field right now. I'll tell you that much. It is a crowded field right now. As a completely fixed blade maker. Yeah. How do you see that market different from the uh, folding market? Well, I think the folding market, there's, uh, there's more lucrative style buyers. If you know what I mean. You know, there's people spending more money on them. There's people spending more money on them. There's a lot of variety in the two to five thousand dollar folder market. And really, I mean, that you're narrowed down a lot in fixed blades when you get that high up. There, there are fixed blades that expensive, but there's not. You know. But it is, it's crowded out here right now. I think the TV show has a big, a big effect on that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Forged in Fire. Yeah. I think, um, also that, uh, folding knives are, people consider them imminently more carryable. And I guess maybe they are in, in terms of legality and stuff. But this is not a, uh, uh, an attitude I espouse. But if, if you're a knife enthusiast and you're not getting in trouble with the law all the time, sometimes you might want to, carry a fixed blade or um you know i i myself do um and it's not necessarily uh legal unless unless i'm wearing it out and i don't i'm not comfortable with that so i don't do it that often right and uh what state are you in i'm in virginia okay which oddly enough has some pretty old school knife laws old school meaning like i would think an old school state like virginia wouldn't have many restrictions but we Mm. do and they're ridiculous you gotta get doug ritter on that yeah i've had him on the show a couple of times and (laughs) and he uh he came on right after uh, our our ridiculous governor decided not to sign switch bills into legality uh, switch blades into legality yeah he had just uh, gone through that blackface thing and was all embarrassed so didn't want to uh, raise any hackles <laughs> with a with a switch blade legislation yeah he's an amazing guy i'm glad uh, he is. i'm he got, so he got glad so, he's he got so much done here in georgia that i think the law is kind of silly you're allowed to carry a knife with up to a 12 inch blade Without a permit. <laughs> wow. Well, how about <laughs> Which that? is ridiculous. <laughs> Who, car- <laughs> Who carries that? Yeah, exactly. And why didn't they allow me my cavalry saber? <laughs> right. You can't, I mean, presumably you get a permit for everything over 12 inches, yeah. right? I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. I could get a permit and carry my cavalry saber. Yeah. yeah. Pretty sure. <laughs> it should be covered under your CCW. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so where do you see Fiddleback Forge headed in the future? I just think I'm going to design more knives. I'm going to keep teaching knife making. I love to teach it. Uh, um, that, that's it. I'm just going to keep making knives. I love it. I love making knives. I love designing them. I love taking it from design to a product. Uh, so I just thought I'd figure I'm just going to keep on trucking. Do you have a favorite of your own model? 
right now I love that new Shogun and the fillet knife. I've never done a fillet knife before. That fillet knife I've got right now, that handle is so good. Ugh, I love that knife. It's going to be, I really enjoy it. We're going to release the first couple this week, but those two new models, the Shogun and the fillet knife, I think are, the handles are as good as any I've ever done. So with the with the fillet knife, was learning to grind something that thin and flexible, was that already in your wheelhouse or was that a learning curve to, to get there? It's funny. Uh, I, I learned that from Joey Berry, really. He's my one of my newest apprentices and he's in the shop and he does kitchen knives and he's just oh, unbelievably yes. good at it. Uh, and, you know, kitchen knives are the hardest fixed blade knife to make. The, the high grind on the very hard stainless, on the very hard steels. Very, very thin edges. These things make the knife complicated to make. So he's very good at it. I've just been watching him and I'm thinking, you know, I could do that. So we'll see. No doubt. No doubt you could. And you'd put a beautiful handle on it. Yeah, the handle's good. <laughs> <laughs> that I can do. <laughs> so where do, where do people find your knives? Uh, where can they see them? Where can they buy them? Well, we use a whole lot of dealers. They're all on the Fiddleback Forge website. You can get them from our website. Uh, there's user markets at Facebook, but, uh, you know, Old Town Cutlery, DLT, Knife Ship Free, The Knife Connection, Lee's Cutlery. They, these are all, they're, they're, they're all those dealers have my knives and more, and they're all listed on the Fiddleback Forge website. And uh, you you can also go right to your website yes, and buy. Yes, right and, and, and it is but, beautiful. Uh, look, a, a, a purchase from a dealer is a purchase from the knife maker. So support the dealers, too. Absolutely. So let me just ask you before I let you go. Okay. Do you have a knife story you could regale us with? Something funny, something scary, something anything? <laughs> I have a lot of broken knives story. <laughs> I tend to break knives a lot. <laughs> um, but you know, no, I, I don't, I, I, I spent my whole childhood bumming around with the K bar knife, but every time I think I got in trouble, that wasn't what, uh, that wasn't the cause of the trouble. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I like it. Bumming around childhood with a K bar. Yeah. Spoken like a true knife guy. Yeah. Well, Andy Roy of Fiddleback Forge, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Great. Right, thank you. Oh, it's, it's been my pleasure. And uh, now having spoken with you, I'm, I'm going to feel a, 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 an, an imperative pull to buy a needle or oh, yeah? a CR1 or something, but probably the needle. That's like kind of my, that's, right, my, that's my style. <laughs> cool. Cool. Show me pictures when you get it. I will indeed. I'm going to get it with that maroon handle that you showed off last week. That was bad. Awesome. Bad and great good, one. of course. Yep. All righty, sir. It's been a pleasure. Hey, thank you very much. Take care. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. And back on the Knife Junkie podcast, Jim Person along with uh, Bob, the Knife Junkie, uh, DeMarco, and interview there with Andy Roy from Fiddlepack Forge. Bob, uh, what, what were your thoughts, key takeaways? Well, knife making proves to be quite a solitary activity, you know, from a lot of the people we talk to. It's a lot of hours holed up alone in your shop, toiling in obscurity until you burst onto the scene. And Andy's story is a little bit different because he has, like a couple of other people we've spoken to recently... He has a small shop and he, everything that goes out of his shop touches his hands. You know, he, he has a major uh, role in forming each knife. Yet he's surrounded by three or four or five workers and apprentices and other knife people who are helping him in his venture. And he in turn is helping them in theirs, you know, with, with his apprentice program and with encouraging, uh, the, the, Encouraging the knife makers that work with him to pursue their own careers, like the gentleman he mentioned with the, uh, who makes the kitchen knives, which is an incredibly difficult pursuit. To me, that's the old school and proper way of going about business. Not that there aren't other proper ways, but that whole idea of bringing in newer generations, newer talent, uh, and cultivating it and encouraging it while you're getting labor on your own project. So everyone kind of wins here. You're mm -hmm. lifting up the next generation, if you will, uh, but you are also being lifted by that generation as you try and output the the production you're looking to output. Right. Win-win for everybody, yeah. as you said. Yeah. It just seemed like a cool guy. Seems like a great place to work. And you were mentioning off-air, Jim, about how uh, he had a recent uh, gathering, a hammer in, I think, at his, uh, his shop. His shop looks so cool. One of the things I love to do is look at uh, famous artists' studios and famous knife makers' shops, and his shop just looks great. And uh, it just looks like a great environment 
So just another person I've spoken with where I'm, I'm getting clues on what my future life will be. And future road trips, perhaps. And future road trips, <laughs> indeed. He's, uh, he's down in Georgia, and, uh, and I've never been to Georgia. One of the few well, states I haven't been to, so. Really? Yeah. Well, Blade Show's coming up. I'll tie indeed that in with it. it. Is. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening to episode 52 of the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie person. I want to thank you for joining us, and uh, be sure to uh, catch us again midweek for episode number 53 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.